Okay. Good evening, everyone. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Welcome to the law, love of your will. Welcome back, everyone. Last time we were together, we looked at the nature and purpose of Liber 15, the Gnostic Mass. We saw that its author, Aleister Crowley, intended it to function as a religious rite for Ordo Templi Orientis, analogous to the Mass of the Roman Catholic Church. We saw that as a religious rite, the purpose of the Gnostic Mass is to represent and celebrate what Crowley calls truth. We saw that this truth takes two forms, truth external to us and truth internal to us. External truth is the kind of truth pertaining to matters of fact. When we say that we're on the surface of a planet orbiting a star, that's external truth. That's a matter of fact. The same goes for if I say it's October 21st, we're in the city of Seattle, I'm delivering a lecture to you, you are listening to that lecture. The words that I'm saying are generating thoughts and impressions in your head that you're aware of. You are feeling excited to hear what I'm going to say, you are apprehensive, you are somewhere in between. These are all matters of fact, right? They're all things that we can verify. And we can contrast these statements of fact with falsity. And if we're talking about facts of nature, we tend to talk about superstition, especially in the context of, of religion. And we saw that one of Crowley's goals in writing the Gnostic Mass was to portray truths of nature accurately enough so, that, so as to not offend common sense. So it served as a kind of backstop to, to the ritual. We looked at some of the ways in which he did that. We saw how labor and enjoyment in particular serve as focal points for the Gnostic Mass. We saw that nature was represented and adored insofar as it supports our work and our leisure. And we saw how the light of the sun and procreation in particular are celebrated in Liber 15. We saw that we are not islands, but we are supported by a vast interconnected system of causes and effects. And our activities are supported by those causes and effects and they, they feed into it. And so nature is something we ought to acknowledge and, and be grateful for. We also saw how the sun and procreation serve as means to access to a kind of immortality. Having and raising children in particular are ways of participating in the continuation of the species. It's a kind of relative immortality. You are connected to and serving a higher power, the continuation of humanity. And we saw how the relationship of the individual to the species is analogous to the relationship of the earth to the sun. After considering external truth, we then considered internal truth. As the physical sun is the symbol of the divine in external nature, so is the star or the sun of the soul the symbol of the divine within us. We saw that the term star comes from the first chapter of the book of the law, which reads, every man and every woman is a star. We saw that the star is an aggregate of experiences, the ecstatic union and reunion of Hadith with Nuit. So while the nature of external truth is the correspondence of a proposition with some state of affairs, the nature of internal love, no, sorry, internal truth is love. It's participation or knowing in the biblical sense. And rather than being a detached relationship of a knower to a fact, it is the loss of the knower in the known. We also saw that there is a hierarchical relationship between internal and external truth, with external truth dependent upon internal truth. In the language of Kabbalah, the Ruach is dependent upon the Neshama. In other words, knowledge as representation, or what we were calling propositional knowing, is grounded in a more fundamental kind of knowing. And unlike more analytical or even practical forms of knowing, this deeper kind of knowing is participatory. That which knows must conform itself to the know, to what it knows. In other words, it's a kind of knowing which cannot help but transform the knower through knowing it. And we're going to return to that idea tonight. And so rather than talking about this kind of knowing as a detached analysis, we instead talked about it as an ongoing dynamic process of fittedness between the unfathomable depths of ourselves and the unfathomable depths 
of the world. In the language of Thelema, this is the play or the ecstasy of Hadit and Nuit. This play or lovemaking gives rise to our sense of ourselves as being in a world. Because all of our external knowing is grounded in this deeper sense of inner truth, we're not able to directly know or directly control this underlying process of fittedness. Any act of reflection is the result of the union of Hadith with Nui. We're always one step behind it. So we should not regard ourselves as either Hadith or Nui, but rather as the product of their loving. And as that loving is continual and unending, we are open-ended individuals. The Thalamic ideal of humanity is the dynamic growth of the individual. Since the purpose of religion is to represent and celebrate truth, and since truth is ultimately love, this explains why the Gnostic Mass portrays a love story. Nuit is unfathomable. Hadit is unfathomable. They're what Crowley calls incommensurables. Both are beyond our ability to know or to control. But we have indirect access to their play by means of the image or the symbol of love. So when we observe and participate in the Gnostic Mass, we're engaging symbolically with the deep foundations of knowing and of experience. And we come to understand and appreciate Libra 15, we're also gaining insight into the nature of ourselves. As our insight into ourselves deepens, so can our insight into the ritual. So Libra 15 has this power to seed a process of cascading insights, which can lead to a breakthrough or a religious experience. And I claimed last time that this was an appropriate way of understanding Crowley's claim that the Gnostic Mass, the purpose of it is to consummate the union of the individual soul with the universal soul, and thereby potentially bring us to ecstasy. So last time we considered truth as love. Tonight we will consider truth as life. Rather than speaking of truth as contrasted with falsity, we will instead talk about truth as what is living versus what is dead. The Gnostic Mass is a love story, but it's equally a story about how a dead man in a tomb is called to arise. What is it that makes an individual alive? We can answer this from a biological perspective, but we can also answer it from a spiritual perspective. From the spiritual perspective, the question isn't what makes matter alive so much as what makes a life worth living. These will all be themes of tonight's talk. Now, for those unfamiliar with me, I am Intelikea. I am giving tonight's talk on behalf of Horizon Lodge Ordo Templi Orientis in Seattle, Washington. If you are watching this lecture at a later date on YouTube and you enjoy it, please consider donating a few dollars to Horizon. Even if you're not enjoying it, you might consider giving a few dollars to Horizon. Your donation helps us pay the rent on this Gnostic Mass temple that I'm currently standing in, and it allows us to continue to bring you content like this throughout the course of the year. A donation link is down in the description. And while I am giving tonight's talk on behalf of Horizon, the opinions expressed are my own and do not necessarily represent those of Horizon or Oro Templi Orientis. The ideas expressed in this lecture are not spoken on behalf of authority, so I'm not speaking from authority in OTO or any other organization, but rather from some relative amount of expertise. You'll have to decide, you know, how much. <laughs> You should accept or reject my conclusions based on how well I support them with evidence and argumentation, not based on my position in OTO, my winning personality, or my incredible good looks. Now, with that out of the way, let's talk about Thelema. So, to continue and build upon our discussion of truth in the Gnostic Mass, we need to continue and build upon the Thelemic account of the individual. Last time we considered the cobs of the individual as the source of inner truth and indirectly as the source of outer truth. We saw that the cobs is the secret, true self of the individual, the sun of the soul around which the other aspects of the personality revolve like planets. 
Tonight, we're going to talk more about that which is symbolized by, by the planets in this analogy and the way in which light and life are conducted from the center of ourselves outward to reach these other parts of the self. If the secret center of ourselves is called the cobs, Crowley's word for the elements of the personality revolving around the cobs is the ku. This term comes from the 8th and 9th verses of the first chapter of the Book of the Law, which read, The cobs is in the ku, not the ku in the cobs. Worship then the cobs, and behold, my light shed over you. Crowley defines the ku as the magical garment of the cobs. Cobs, he says, is the secret light, or LVX. The ku is the magical entity of a man. The cobs, or inmost light, is the original individual eternal essence. The ku is the magical garment which it weaves for itself, a form for its being beyond form, by use of which it can gain experience through self-consciousness. The cobs needs a ku, or a magical image, he says, in order to play its part in the great drama. This ku, again, needs the proper costume, a suitable body of flesh, and this costume must be worthy of the play. So the idea is that the cobs on its own is unable to gain experience either of itself or of the universe. In order to do that, it has to create this thing called the ku, the function of which is to enable the cobs to gain experience through self-consciousness. So the ku is Crowley's term for those faculties of mind with which we're able to engage in reflection, self-awareness, and observation. The cobs itself, we are told, is beyond form. In other words, it's unmanifest. It doesn't appear or look like anything. As we saw last time, the interior depth of each individual is inaccessible to reflection. But we're told that the coup is the form that the cobs weaves for itself. In other words, it, the coup is the means by which the cobs manifests itself to itself and to the rest of the world. As we saw last time, Hadith is the principle of going, change, or love. It is anonymous and impersonal. But we're not anonymous beings, and we do not find ourselves just going aimlessly through the world. We find ourselves in a particular situation at any time, having a particular kind of experience with certain qualities. We come from some origin in the past. We find ourselves going towards some destination in the future. Crowley adds that this coup, again, needs the proper costume, a body of flesh. In other words, for experience and self-awareness to be possible, we need both minds and bodies. This is ultimately why the cobs incarnates. It needs a mind and a body in order to participate in the great drama of life. But this decision to incarnate and thereby become dependent upon a mind and a body comes with a price. With the decision to incarnate comes the illusion of duality. To know itself, Crowley says, each such star or soul must eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil by accepting labor and pain as its portion and death as its doom. That is, it must reveal its nature to itself by formulating that nature as duality. By duality, Crowley primarily means the difference we make in our minds between subject and object. I am a particular individual consciousness occupying a particular portion of space. From my perspective, part of the universe over there is made manifest to a consciousness over here. While we saw that the cobs in itself is the ecstatic union of Hadith with Nuit, in fact, the depths of ourselves are not in immediate contact with external nature. The mind and the body or what we were calling the Ruach and the Nefesh, they mediate or they come between the divine depths of ourselves and the depths of the world. 
the mind and the body are there to reveal nature, to make it manifest, to make it available to the hadith within. However, in doing so, they create the illusion of a separation between the interior of ourselves and the depths of the world. There's the appearance of a separation between myself and my mind and the world it perceives and acts upon. Crowley identifies this fact of human experience as the source of our suffering. Writing in Libra 150, he says, Understand now that in yourselves is a certain discontent. Analyze well its nature. At the end in every case is one conclusion. The ill springs from the belief in two things, the self and the not-self, and the conflict between them. This is also a restriction of the will. He who is sick is in conflict with his own body. He who is poor is at odds with society, and so for the rest. Ultimately, therefore, the problem is how to destroy this perception of duality, to attain to the apprehension of unity. So in order to have experience of itself and the universe, the Cobbs has to weave this coup for itself, this magical garment. It has to manifest itself. It has to manifest the universe by means of a mind and a body. But the mind and the body can only represent the universe by means of the artifice of duality, a sense of the separation of subject and object. Yet by introducing a distinction between subject and object, the world becomes a painful place. The star experiences something akin to a fall from grace, as indicated by the metaphor of consuming the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The result is that the individual is typically bewildered by the irrational character of the universe, which he takes to be real, and he cannot but regard it as aimless and absurd. The adventures of his mind and body, with their desires for material and moral well-being, are obviously as foredoomed to disaster as Don Quixote's. He must be a fool if he struggles on against inexorable fate to obtain results which he knows can only end in catastrophe. A climax the more bitter as he clings the more closely to his impossible ideals. The human being in their natural state is therefore a perishable parasite, bred of the earth's crust, crawling irritably upon it for a span, and at last returning to the dirt whence he sprang. That's basically the human condition, according to Crowley. Crowley's term for this near hopeless state of most people is the man of earth, a term that comes from L140, who calls the Selamites will do no wrong if he look but close into the word. For there are therein three grades, the hermit and the lover and the man of earth. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Crowley symbolizes the man of earth by the inverted pentagram, matter dominating spirit, the hanged man and the fool, the condition of those who are not adepts. Spirit in this case symbolizes the star, the true essence of the individual. It's dominated by matter, meaning the individual has confused themselves with their thoughts and the matter which is revealed by the body and the mind. Until such a person has remedied this basic confusion by becoming the upright pentagram in which spirit rules over matter, they must remain bewildered by the irrational character of the universe. The human condition, at least in an uninitiated state, is obviously an unhappy one. Several lines in our holy books reflect the state of affairs. For example, L217 to 18 read, Hear me, ye people of sighing. The sorrows of pain and regret are left to the dead and the dying. The folk that not know me as yet. These are dead, these fellows. They feel not. We are not for the poor and the sad. The lords of the earth are our kinsfolk. Commenting on these verses, Crowley says, But the poor and the outcast are the petty thoughts and the clephotic thoughts and the sad thoughts. These must be rooted out, or the ecstasy of Hadith is not in us. They are the weeds in the garden that starve the flower. Now, by cliphotic here, Crowley does not mean demonic, as many occultists nowadays understand that term. 
What he means is disordered. As Liber 30, the book of the balance reads, Know then, that as man is born into this world amidst the darkness of matter and the strife of contending forces, so must his first endeavor be to seek the light through their reconciliation. Because we have not found the true center of ourselves, the inner truth represented by the cobs, we take external truth to be the only kind of truth that there is. As Crowley says, to fall in love with the coup is to forget our truth. If we adore form, that is, appearance, it becomes opaque to being and may soon prove false to itself. As such, we are subject to the capriciousness of our thoughts and feelings about unstable and unreliable external states of affair. The Book of the Law likens these individuals to the dead and the dying. Crowley goes on to say, the dead and the dying who know not Hadith, are in the illusion of sorrow. Not being Hadith, they are shadows, puppets, and what happens to them does not matter. Those who sorrow are not real people at all, not stars for the time being. The default condition of most people, Crowley says, is a kind of living death. We have not realized our true nature. It has not yet been fully incarnated in us. The deepest part of ourselves desires to have contact with the deepest parts of nature, and yet it remains frustrated by the confusion inherent in the very instrument it has contrived to make that very nature manifest. In attempting to br bring Nuit closer to him, Hadit has inadvertently pushed her away. We fear biological death, but what we should really fear is that we will never have actually lived. We will never have actually been really born in the spiritual sense. The state of being alive in one sense but dead in another is described in Liber 7 as a gray land. Farther and farther we float, yet we are still. It is the chain of systems that is falling away from us. First falls the silly world, the world of the old gray land. Falls it unthinkably far, with its sorrowful, bearded face presiding over it. It fades to silence and woe. Far from being a place of evil, the Cleefoth is a gray place. It's neither white nor black, neither fully alive nor fully dead, neither this nor that, not really anything. It's a poorly defined middle place, a silly place of sorrows. So what does it mean to liberate ourselves from the condition of the man of earth, to extract ourselves from the old gray land of the Klifoth? There are many different ways Crowley symbolically represents the path of liberation. Let's stick with the symbolism we've been working with so far, that of the cobs and the coup or the unknown soul of the individual and its magical garment. If suffering arises because the attempt of Hadit to unite with Nuit is frustrated, then obviously the overcoming of that frustration and the reunion of Hadit with Nuit will bring at least a temporary end to that suffering. Crowley says of the liberated individual that he has freed Hadit in the core of his star from the illusion veils of the coup so that the two infinities become one and none. But since the coup is necessary for the cops to have any experience at all, this liberation can't consist in just simply getting rid of the cop, or the, sorry, getting rid of the coup altogether. Instead, it must consist in a modification of the coup. Our minds and bodies, he says, are veils of the light within. The uninitiate is a dark star, and the great work for him is to make his veils transparent by purifying them. This purification is really simplification. It's not that the veil is dirty, but that the complexity of its folds makes it opaque. The great work, therefore, consists principally in the solution of complexes. Everything in itself is perfect, but when things are muddled, they become evil. 
So this term complexes you might be familiar with from analytical psychology. It doesn't mean quite the same thing as it does, for example, in, in Jung. I'll, I'll explain what he has in mind. The Cobbs is a light that's shining within us, which is metaphorically obscured by what he's calling folds in the magical garment. Presumably this refers to the idea we looked at a moment ago. We're confused about the nature of what it is that we're perceiving and who the perceiver is in this case. We're falling in love with form, with manifestation, taking that to be the ultimate reality. We become identified with our thoughts and feelings about things. This perpetuates the sense of division between us and what we're looking for in life. The solution to this is to transform the coup so that it does its job properly, which is to conduct the light within us outward into manifest existence, so as to alleviate the sense of separation from reality. Crowley contrasts this idea with that of the Gnostic idea of the Pleroma. So he's commenting on this passage, the, uh, of the Cobbs is in the coup and not the coup in the Cobbs. And he asks, why are we told that the Cobbs is in the coup and not the coup in the Cobbs? Did we suppose the converse? I think that we're warned against the idea of a pleroma, a flame of which we are sparks, to which we return when we attain. That would indeed be to make the whole curse of separate existence ridiculous, a senseless and inexcusable folly. It would throw us back on the dilemma of Manichaeism. The idea of incarnations perfecting a thing, originally perfect by definition, is imbecile. The only sane solution is, as given previously, to suppose that the perfect enjoys experience of apparent imperfection. Okay. Lots of digesting here. What is he talking about? This word pleroma, it's a Greek word, which literally means fullness. It's a technical term in the texts of Gnostic Christianity, where it refers to the totality of divine powers. Crowley tended to think of it as an impersonal unity, analogous to Brahma or Ainsof. For instance, in his 1902 essay, Bereshith, he says, in the Advaitist idea, personality, bereft of all its qualities, disappears and is lost, while in its place of impersonal unity, the Pleroma, Parabrahma, or the Allah of the unity adoring followers of Muhammad. Crowley tended to view the Pleroma as an impersonal unity in which our individuality is lost. So according to Gnostic cosmogony, the world that we find ourselves in is outside of the Pleroma. However, each individual carries a bit of the pleroma within themselves. So if you find this pleroma within yourself, you can save yourself from a state of what's called deficiency, characteristic of the material world, and you can restore yourself to an otherwise inaccessible sense of divine fullness. An example of this doctrine may be found in the second century Valentinian Gnostic writing, The Gospel of Truth. This fullness, or pleroma, which has no deficiency but fills up deficiency, is provided to fill a person's need so that the person may receive grace. While deficient, the person had no grace, and because of this, a diminishing took place where there was no grace. When the diminished part was restored, the person in need was revealed as fullness. So Gnosticism entails that the material world is in and of itself deficient. Its creation was an unfortunate tragedy or a mistake. And by virtue of being embodied souls, we ourselves have fallen into a state of deficiency. So to be born can be viewed as nothing but a tragedy. This state of deficiency can only be overcome by withdrawing from embodiment and returning to a more original, undifferentiated identification with the pleroma, which functions like a divine overbeing. Thelema bears a superficial resemblance to this. We are in something like a fallen state, which can only be corrected by overcoming our sense of separateness. And Libra 15 is, after all, called the Gnostic Mass. 
That may lead one to believe that the mass dramatizes Valentinian Gnostic doctrine of the type I just quoted. But there are key differences, and looking at these differences really helps to bring out what is distinctive in the Thalamic path of initiation, or sorry, the Thalamic path of liberation, which is dramatized in the Mass. So first of all, while incarnation does give rise to suffering, it does not give rise to it directly, but only indirectly. According to the Book of the Law, incarnation entails suffering or hurt, not because matter is evil, not because the universe was created outside the Pleroma, and not because the universe or we are in some defic way deficient in divinity. On the contrary, we're told in the Book of the Law that space and the matter filling it are a goddess, and that existence itself is pure joy. Second, this implies that the source of suffering is not to be found in the deficiency or evil of matter or anything that exists. Rather, the source of the suffering is to be found in us. Suffering arises from the dualistic mode of representing the universe. Third, this has implications for what liberation consists in. If you think that matter is evil, or even just deficient in divinity because of its distance from the One, or because it was created by a delusional demiurge, or because of its impermanence and its instability. Incarnation can only be viewed as a loss. The soul taking a body has to be a tragedy, the natural remedy of which would be the abandonment of this world. That might mean transcending the planetary spheres, as in Gnosticism or Hermitism, it might mean extinction, as in the version of Buddhism that Crowley would have been familiar with. But the only viable paths would have to be ascetic. They would have to be renunciate paths. We would also expect such a path to either be suspicious of magic or just straight out hostile to it. In Gnostic cosmogony in particular, angels tend to function as agents of the Demiurge. They're sort of like the Smith character from, from the Matrix. Any angel or spirit you contact by means of magic would be just as likely to attempt to delude you and keep you imprisoned here. So for this reason, Gnosticism tends to be a path of mysticism rather than magic. But Thelema differs from Gnosticism in all of these respects. It's a non-renunciate path. The goal is not to escape existence, but rather to realize and incarnate the pure joy of existence, right here in this universe, in this life. This is accomplished by means of meditative techniques, but it's also accomplished through ritualistically working with the divine energies of manifest existence. It makes it similar to Tantra. It includes yoga and magic. So the differences here are not superficial. The reasons for these differences are actually quite deep, and they are entailed by what the Book of the Law says the universe is and what the human being is. Liberation in Thelema does not consist in escaping manifest existence. The solution is not to dissolve ourselves in some kind of, you know, overmind. The solution to suffering is to be found in and through existence. And yet, it is the very duality of manifest existence that gives rise to suffering in the first place. So now we appear to be in something like a double bind. The Thalamic solution to suffering is to overcome duality, and yet duality is unavoidable. We could frame the problem another way, and we could say that relationality the quality of being in relation to some reality outside of my control is an unavoidable fact of life. No matter how much control I exert over myself or my environment, I can still be impinged upon in ways that are potentially upsetting or even destructive to me. My vulnerability is an essential facet of my existence. My being is porous all the way down. 
This follows from the fact that there is no way for the cobs to know itself or the universe without opening itself to that universe. So then the question becomes, how do we relate to vulnerability and openness in such a way to become free? This is the opposite of what I might term vulgar thelema. Vulgar Thalema says that you assert your autonomous individuality over and against the universe and other people in it. You use magic and an unhealthy dose of fantasy to build yourself up into the illusion of a super autonomous being. As we'll see in a moment, Crowley calls this a masturbatory fantasy. The actual path of Thalemic liberation, which is a path of erotic liberation, is working with duality until it expresses individuality. In other words, the living symbol of individuality is going to be dividual. As Crowley says, the great work is the uniting of opposites. It may mean the uniting of the soul with God, of the microcosm with the macrocosm, of the female with the male, of the ego with the not ego, or whatnot. This is why so many of the symbols of the liberated individual, or what Crowley refers to as the God-man, are two in one. Or at the very least, they express the unity of opposites. So you have Beast and Babylon conjoined, Baphomet, the Adept and the Holy Guardian Angel, the Sphinx. And of course, in the Gnostic Mass, the Lance and the Grail, the Priest and the Priestess, Male and female united in the symbol of the sun. These are all ways of making the unmanifest manifest, of presenting in dualistic form that which transcends duality. So next, let's now look at how Crowley symbolizes the process of working with the divine energies of manifestation to embody truth. So, Crowley taught different magical and mystical techniques for ritualistically working with these energies of the Ku. These are the tasks of the grades of the outer order of his magical order AA. Crowley utilizes more than one metaphor to describe that process of transformation, whereby the Ku becomes transparent to the light of the cobs. In fact, the language of cobs and Ku is itself just a symbol set. <laughs> We're using this to represent and get at processes that are ultimately invisible and matters of internal truth. So it's important not to take, take it so literally. In a moment, I'm going to present you with an interpretation of the first part of the Gnostic Mass, the section called the Ceremony of the Introit. But before I do that, I want to introduce you to two additional symbol sets. They are ways of symbolizing the process of disciplining the coup, which we've seen so far. But they utilize symbols which help tie these principles closer to the drama of Liber 15. The first is referred to as the sacrament of penance. And the second is one we've already considered last time, the phallus. So Crowley describes the sacrament of penance in chapter 4 of part 2 of Magic. The sacrament of penance is the work of the scourge, the dagger, and the chain. These represent the three alchemical principles of sulfur, mercury, and salt. Sulfur represents the energy of things. Mercury, their fluidity. Salt, their fixity. They are analogous to fire, air, and water. There we go. Fire, air, water. An almost exact analogy is given by the three gunas of the Hindus, sattvas, rajas, and tamas. Sattvas is mercury, equable, calm, clear. Rajas is sulfur, active, excitable, even fierce. Tamas is salt, thick, sluggish, heavy, dark. The scourge is sulfur. And by the way, I'm just quoting now from Crowley in uh, chapter 4 of part 2 of Magic. The application of the scourge excites our sluggish natures, and it may further be used as an instrument of correction to castigate rebellious volitions. 
It's applied to the nefesh, the animal soul, natural desires, right? So you take the scourge, and you do one of these with yourself. The dagger is mercury. It is used to calm too great heat by the letting of blood. And it is this weapon which is plunged into the side or heart of the magician to fill the holy cup. Those faculties which come between the appetites and the reason are thus dealt with. The chain is salt. It serves to bind the wandering thoughts. And for this reason is placed about the neck of the magician where Da'ath is situated. Right? So he has it here this idea of the tree of life mapped onto the body. Right? The scourge keeps the aspiration keen. The dagger expresses the determination to sacrifice all. And the chain restricts any wandering. So that the sacrament of penance is carried out as preparation for magical working. Striking oneself with the scourge fights off torpor and stimulates aspiration. It excites that fervor and ardency necessary to pursue our spiritual ends. Cutting oneself with the dagger represents severing the connection between the appetite and reason, between the lower parts of the self and the will to unite with the divine. It represents the act of discrimination. And finally, the chain binds wandering thoughts. It fixes the mind to the object of the magical working. In the context of meditation, close analogies would be the mental qualities of ardor, alertness, and mindfulness. When these three qualities cooperate and mutually support one another, concentration naturally arises. In other words, concentration or union between the mind and its object is not something we simply will. You don't just sit there and say, concentrate, concentrate, concentrate. Right? <laughs> you have to work with these energies of the mind and the body to, make, to allow concentration to happen. It's the natural outcome of that mutual support. This quality is represented in magic by the holy oil, which is represented in the next chapter. The holy oil, Crowley says, is the aspiration of the magician. It is that which consecrates him to the performance of the great work. This aspiration is not ambition. It is a quality bestowed from above. It is not the will of the magician, the desire of the lower to reach the higher, but it is that spark of the higher in the magician which wishes to unite the lower with itself. So once the energies of the mind and the body are properly balanced and directed toward the proper end, the spark of the higher in the magician, what we've been calling the cobs, unites itself with the lower parts of the soul. So the idea is not that we will contact with the cobs, but rather that we turn ourselves into the medium through which that light can flow. This is consonant with those passages we were looking at a moment ago, in which the coup is likened to a veil, the folds of which must be resolved to allow the light to penetrate. Crowley represents a similar dynamic between lower and higher parts of the self in chapter 15 of the Book of Lies, this time utilizing the symbols of the pyramid and the phallus. This is chapter 15 of the Book of Lies called the Gun Barrel. Mighty and erect is this will of mind, this pyramid of fire whose summit is lost in heaven. Upon it have I burned the corpses of my desires. Mighty and erect is this phallus of my will. The seed thereof is that which I have borne within me from eternity, and it is lost within the body of Our Lady of the Stars. I am not I. I am but an hollow tube to bring down fire from heaven. Mighty and marvelous is this weakness, this heaven which draweth me into her womb, this dome which hideth, which absorbeth me. This is the night wherein I am lost, the love through which I am no longer I. This chapter, which has the same number as Libra 15, opens by introducing two symbols, the pyramid and the phallus. Both of these are equated with the personal will. 
Both are described as being mighty and erect. Upon the pyramid in particular, the corpse of my desires has been burned. The phallus is described as bearing within it a seed. It is described as having been carried within me from eternity. This is reminiscent of the symbolism of the son of the soul, or the cobs, the secret seed or core of which is hadith. It should also bring to mind the final stanza of our church's creed. I confess my life one, individual and eternal, that was, and is, and is to come. Shift in the symbolism occurs. I am not I. The letter I here has a dual significance. On the one hand, it's the personal pronoun. It refers to the subject of experience, both in the sense of the person who accomplishes mundane tasks, such as going to the grocery store, going to work, but it also refers to the person who accomplishes the great work, who goes through these tasks of erecting the pyramid or attempting to unite with God. At the beginning of this chapter, both the erect pyramid and the erect phallus are described as mine, as expressive of my will. They belong to me. I get to take credit for them. I own them. They are the result of my self-discipline. I'm hot shit for doing this. But then a shift occurs, and the sense of ownership over the work is now being effaced or washed away. Remember what we read earlier, a moment ago, about the holy oil. The holy oil is applied after the sacrament of penance. But unlike the sacrament of penance, which is a sacrament of self-discipline, the holy oil does not represent one's personal ambition. It represents a quality bestowed from above and by grace. It is that spark of the higher in the magician which wishes to unite the lower with itself. I am not I. I am but an hollow tube to bring down fire from heaven. This should bring to mind a line from the anthem of the Gnostic Mass. The priest addresses the secret self as the true fire within the reed. We tend to think of the penis as an organ of penetration. It ejaculates seed from out of itself. It projects its essence or its power onto, into another reality. Similarly, we think of the self as subjugating the world to itself. I judge the world. I investigate it. I get at the truth. I pursue spiritual truth. We even talk about, you know, penetrating insight, <laughs> right? Getting into the depths of an investigation. I impose self-discipline. I act. We say, I do my will. What this passage seems to be suggesting is that, at least at its culmination, at its point of maximum self-assertion, the will turns into its opposite. It becomes passive. The phallus is not functioning here as an organ of penetration at this moment. Rather, it's being penetrated by fire. It becomes vaginal and receptive. At this point, the phallus becomes a hollow tube to bring down fire from heaven. Remember the first stanza of our creed. I believe in one star, in the company of stars, of whose fire we are created and to which we shall return. The fire is the fire of the sun entering into the erect phallus. The implication is that the building up of the pyramid or the phallus, the direction of the will toward the ultimate spiritual goal, puts one's ordinary sense of self into relation with the cobs or the son of the soul. But once that relationship is established, one's being is filled with the fire or the light of the cobs. The polarity shifts. It's really the cobs at that point which has agency, not me. The relationship to inner truth is not like our relationship to external truth. We pursue external truth. We investigate. We get to the bottom of things, right? We finally know it. Internal truth isn't like that. It's not 
something that you possess. You enter into relation with it, and through that relation, you are transformed by it. <laughs> the discipline of getting at external truth is the discipline of careful observation and not letting our biases get in the way of our investigation. The discipline required of internal truth is the discipline to remain in relation and to hold ourselves open to it. As we're going to see probably in the next lecture, maybe after that, Crowley's word for that capacity is called chastity. Paradoxically, the discipline of chastity is what defines the whore, Babylon. A moment ago, we were considering the relationship between duality, vulnerability, and suffering. The inescapable fact that I am in relation to and dependent upon a reality outside of myself is at the root of my capacity to suffer. My body is permeable. It can be invaded by pathogens. The genes expressing proteins in my body can become corrupted. I can be pierced by steel, I can be shot, I can be hit by a bus. For that matter, because I'm a social being, because I am psychologically dependent upon other people for a sense of belonging and fulfillment, I can be hurt by other people's words or actions that express or even imply rejection. I'm not a self-enclosed autonomous unit. My life from beginning to end is marked by openness, relation, vulnerability, and therefore the prospects of injury, humiliation, abandonment, betrayal, death, all the perennial problems of life. Writing in his essay, Compensation, Ralph Waldo Emerson remarked, Achilles is not quite invulnerable. The sacred waters did not wash the heel by which Thetis held him. Siegfried, in the Nibelungen, is not quite immortal, for a leaf fell on his back whilst he was bathing in the dragon's blood, and that spot which it covered is mortal. And so it must be. There is a crack in everything God has made. We are creations or extensions of the gods at the centers of our beings. We are cracked, broken, imperfect instruments. The answer to the problem of suffering, according to Crowley, is unity. But unity is not the same thing as the self-assertion of one's autonomy from the rest of the world or all the people in it. Such an attitude is described by Crowley in chapter 60 of the Book of Lies, which he titled, The Wound of Amfortas, so-called because Amfortas was wounded by his own spear, the thing that had made him king. The self-mastery of Percival became the self-masturbatory of the bourgeois. Virtus has become virtue. Commenting on this passage, Crowley says, the real chastity of Percival, or Parcival, a chastity which did not prevent his dipping the point of the sacred lance into the Holy Grail, is distinguished from its misinterpretation by modern crapulence. As a representation of what we can build ourselves up into, the phallus is not completely self-enclosed. It's still permeable. Its attempt at self-completion must always be deferred. Nor is it self-fulfilled. It's hollow. I am not I. I, the phallus in the shape of I, can never fulfill itself. Any attempt to do so undoes itself. The lesson of Amfortas is that it results potentially in self-harm, self, a kind of self-affliction. Yet, rather than being a mere limitation to its fulfillment, the failure of its self-enclosure provides the opening through which may flow the divine essence. Ironically, were there no opening, were we to fulfill for ourselves 
what we imagine it must be like to be gods. The experience of God would become impossible. There is a crack in everything. But as Leonard Cohen added, that's how the light gets in. The great work of uniting ourselves with God requires us to take up our vulnerability, our failure of closure, and to open, hold it open with discipline Godward. It means rejecting every temptation to recoil out of fear and to close the heart to the pain of the universe, a pain which the universe will inevitably conduct our way. Okay, having established this framework, let's use this to interpret the Mass. I'm going to start by interpreting the ceremony of the introit. The ceremony of the introit is part three of Liber 15, though it's the first part of the dramatic performance of the ritual. It starts with the deacon admitting the congregation. Scott, I'm sorry. You're gonna see. You're gonna see yourself a bit, <laughs> and other people in the audience. Some will have to see themselves. <laughs> it starts with the deacon admitting the congregation. It ends when the priestess strokes the lance eleven times. She says, "Be the Lord present among us," and the congregants give the hailing sign and say, "So mote it be." Okay. The ceremony of the introit is important because it represents in dramatic form everything I've just been talking about. It represents the condition of the man of earth or the individual in their natural state. It represents how the relationship between that individual and their star or soul has the potential to bring them out of that state. And it shows how the relationship between their individual, the individual and their soul is mediated by the coup or the magical garment so as to begin to create the two-in-one relationship that defines the God-man and which will drive the ritual forward into its climax. This part of the ritual is also important because it establishes the identity, the role, and also the trajectory of the priest for the rest of the ritual. What's done over there on the west side of the temple at the tomb is in a certain sense undone later on on the east side of the temple. Crowley was very much motivated by this idea of balance and action and reaction. Some might say to an OCD <laughs> extent. So if you understand the setup of this ritual, you're going to be in a really good position to understand its culmination. I'm going to skip the creed. The creed is a profession of the theology of Thelema. The theology of Thelema is dramatized over the course of the entire ritual. Tonight, I just want to focus on one part and just one part of the theology. So when the priestess enters the temple, she's described in the rubric as the virgin. Writing in Appendix 47 to his commentaries, Crowley describes the high priestess. She is his silent self, virgin beyond all veils, made free to teach him by virtue of this third ordeal, wherein passing through the abyss, he has stripped from him every rag of falsehood, his last complexes, even his fantasy that he called I. Right? So this ties in a lot of what we've just been looking at and puts it right into the mass. In the new comment on L322, he says, the kingdom of Malkuth, the virgin bride, and the child is the dwarf self, the phallic consciousness which is the true life of man beyond his veils of incarnation. All right, so this should all be quite familiar. We've encountered this idea of the silent self. It's synonymous with the son of the soul or the cobs, right? He uses the terms interchangeably there. So the priestess in this drama represents the priest's star or cobs. The priestess is his soul. His union with her by means of the union of the lance and the grail represents the fulfillment of his true individuality as the two-in-one male-female, the byproduct of which is the two-in-one Eucharist. She takes a serpentine path to the tomb, involving three and a half circles of the temple. Writing in his commentary on the Gnostic Mass, Frater Sabalzius says, 
the Kundalini, prior to rising up the spine, is said to be coiled three and a half times around the Svayambhu Linga, located in the Muladhara Chakra at the base of the spine. So Crowley associates Muladhara Chakra with either Yesod or Malkuth on the Tree of Life. In L222 we read, I am the snake that giveth knowledge and delight and bright glory, and stir the hearts of men with drunkenness. Commenting on this passage, Crowley says, Hadith now identifies himself with the Kundalini, the central magical force in man. So whether we're talking about the cobs, the son of the soul, the silent self, the virgin self, the kundalini, hadith, we're referring to the same underlying principle. It's the idea of a divine force within us which wants to live. It wants to take its fill of reality. And it's this impulse within us which is giving rise to the sense of time passing and of events happening, right? You know, and, and, and lots of people who lots of people who get involved in spirituality, it usually happens at some point in adolescence that there's some, you know, inchoate stirring within them. They start to seek for something outside of themselves and they, they usually don't know what it is precisely that they're that they're seeking, right? He's he's referring to a just a universal aspect of, of human experience, I think. So this ritual, the Gnostic Mass, is a means of dramatizing as a love story, as a story of resurrection, what it means for this godlike power within us to live to its fullest potential in the course of a human life. And also, one more aside, the, the connection with adolescence and spiritual awakening, awakening is actually here in the Gnostic Mass, as you're going to see that in a second. Approaching the tomb in the west, the priestess draws her sword. She tears down the veil, enclosing the priest in the tomb. She says, By the power of iron, I say unto thee, Arise, in the name of our Lord the Son. She does it with the sword like this. I'll use the clicker. And of our Lord, that thou mayest administer the virtues to the brethren. Now this line is important because in it, the priestess has just described the role of the priest in this ritual, to administer the virtues to the brethren. Any interpretation of the Gnostic Mass has to explain how the different parts of the ritual serve to fulfill this task, which has been appointed to him by the priestess. Now to answer this question fully would require an interpretation of the latter parts of the Mass, which we're not going to get to tonight. For now, suffice to say, the virtues mentioned refer to the sacrament administered at the end of the ritual. It's a sacrament that is consecrated by the virtue of the rod, the brethren in question, or of course the congregants. For our purposes right now though, I want to concentrate on what immediately follows. The priest issues forth from the tomb. Wow, we're getting a really good look at um, Brother David Shoemaker's feet tonight. He gives what are called the three regular steps and the three penal signs. Sorry, Brother David. Uh, these are the steps and the signs of the first three initiatory degrees of OTO as they existed when the ritual was written in 1913. Those rituals symbolize birth, life, and death. And together they make up what's called the Man of Earth initiations. So remember who we said the Man of Earth is. The man of earth is the individual in their natural, uninitiated state. They are in the gray land, the Klephal, which is not a land of demons, but rather a place of confusion and bewilderment, a kind of living death. This association between death and what we ordinarily call life is emphasized by having the priest start out in a tomb. The tomb shows he is not only subject to death, but also suffering, resulting from the general confusion about who and what he really is. After handing the lance over to the priestess, the priest kneels, and with both hands he adores the lance. He says, we might imagine with a note of despair in his voice, cringe, I am a man among men. In other words, I am a man of earth, just like the congregants. 
And now perhaps plaintively he asks, how should I be worthy to administer the virtues to the brethren? And the question is important because it implies that the priestess's actions that she's about to engage in are capable of remedying, remedying the poor condition he finds himself in. Which means that we men and women of earth ought to take careful note. We might learn something here. The nature of those actions is hinted at when the priest kneels. In the rubric it says, he then kneels and worships the lance with both hands. Penitential music. This signals the sacrament of penance, the work of the scourge, the dagger, and the chain. Or more generally, the application of the three alchemical principles of sulfur, mercury, and salt. This is why it helps to focus on principles less so than particular things, because the things usually represent principles. Now, the dagger does not appear in the Gnostic Mass, but the sword does. The priestess uses it to cut down the veil over the tomb, thereby revealing and releasing the priest. This is the faculty of discrimination, which separates the essence of the priest from the inessentials of the environment he finds himself in. It's capable of cutting away bark from wood, like when you're making a wand, right? The word in Hebrew for bark is klipa. No chain appears in the Gnostic Mass, but salt does. Remember, the chain represents the alchemical principle of salt. It's mixed with water, which is then used to make three crosses on the priest, one over his forehead, another over his chest, and a third over his body. This is reminiscent of Libra Pyramidos, which reads, scourge, dagger, and chain, purge, body, breast, and brain. Making the three crosses, the priestess says, be the priest pure of body and soul. Purity, Crowley says, means singleness. If one littlest thought intrude upon the mind of the mystic, his concentration is absolutely destroyed, and his consciousness remains on exactly the same level as the stockbroker's. Purifying the priest with salt water symbolizes the work of the chain, which is to bind the priest's wandering thoughts. Then she makes the same three crosses over him again, this time with the burning incense. Be the priest fervent of body and soul. This reflects the purpose of the scourge, to stimulate aspiration. So what we're seeing in this first part of the ceremony of the introit is the application of three forms of discipline to the priest in the form of the three alchemical principles. First, there has to be the determination to sacrifice all. When the priest steps out of the tomb, that action represents his conscious rejection of the gray land, the living death of the Clifoth. This is symbolized by the sword, which is mercury. Then you have the restriction of wandering thoughts, the purity of mind represented by the salt water. In the context of spiritual practice, we said this is mindfulness, keeping your mind on the task at hand, or what Crowley calls purity. Finally, we have the work of sulfur, as represented by the incense smoke, which is to stoke the fires of aspiration. As we saw before, the sacrament of penance is followed by the application of the holy oil, which represents that spark of the higher in the magician, which wishes to unite the lower with itself. The anointing with holy oil does not take place at all in the Gnostic Mass. Instead, the priestess performs three entirely different actions on the priest. She clothes him in a robe, she crowns him, and then she kneels and she strokes the lance 11 times. First, the priestess robes the priest in a robe of scarlet and gold. She says, Be the flame of the sun thine ambiance, O thou priest of the sun. We're quite familiar already with what the sun is and what it symbolizes. It's our Lord and Father in the universe, the visible sun, which is responsible for all life on earth, and it's the cobs or the sun of the soul, the essence of each individual. Turning toward the inner sun fills us with inner light, awakening us from the dead. Gold is the king scale color of Resh, which is associated with Atu 14, the sun. Scarlet is the king scale color of Aries. Aries is the Agnus Dei, or the Lamb of God. 
can see the ram. Oh, there's the sheep down there. The Lamb of God in Christianity was Christ, the God-man. As we saw earlier, the God-man, or the divine individual, is two in one. As we'll see in a moment, the priestess is gradually transforming the priest into a two-in-one figure. She places the Uraeus crown on his head. She says, Be the serpent thy crown, O thou priest of the Lord. As we have already seen, the, symbol, the serpent is a symbol of Hadith. The serpent is the symbol of divinity and royalty. It is also a symbol of Hadith invoked upon them. The serpent is the Uraeus with the powers of life and death, wise, ecstatic, and mortal, winged and hooded, that he may go as a god swiftly and silently. It refers in this place especially to Hadith. This is also the secret and ineffable lord of the creed, the lord secret and most holy of the second collect, and thou who art I beyond all I am in the anthem. Finally, she kneels. She strokes the lance eleven times, raises her arms, and cries, Be the Lord present among us. All give the hailing sign of the magician, and in unison say, So mote it be. Who is the Lord that the priestess is referring to? A clue is given in the priest's next line. This is the first time he's spoken since asking the priestess how he ought to be made worthy to administer the virtues to the brethren. He says, Thee therefore whom we adore we also invoke by the power of the lifted lance. There is a Lord who is described in the Gnostic Mass as being adored. He is the Lord of life and joy of the fifth collect. Lord of life and joy that art the might of man, that art the essence of every true God that is upon the surface of the earth, continuing knowledge from generation unto generation. Thou adored of us upon heaths and in woods, on mountains and in caves, openly in the marketplaces and secretly in the chambers of our houses, in temples of gold and ivory and marble, as in these other temples of our bodies. We worthily commemorate them worthy that did of old adore thee and manifest thy glory unto men. So what is the identity of this Lord? Is he our Lord, the son of the first collect? Or is he the Lord's secret and most holy of the second collect? Let's reason it out. The Lord of life and joy of the fifth collect is adored in heaths, woods, mountains, caves, presumably while online at Home Depot and everywhere else. In short, he's adored on every place on the surface of the earth. He's clearly visible and sensible, so he cannot be the secret Lord. The secret Lord is unmanifest. The secret Lord also cannot be adored. This is because he is the secret of secrets that are hidden in the being of all that lives. Not thee do we adore, for that which adoreth is also thou. Thou art that, and that am I. So whoever we and the saints are adoring, it can't be Hadit, who is always the adorer, never the adored. But he's not our Lord and Father the Son either. The Son is visible and sensible, for sure, but he is our Lord in the universe who travelleth over the heavens. While the light of the Son may strike the earth and make life possible, the Son himself is not God on the surface of the earth like our Lord of life and joy is. That leaves only one possibility. Consider the first stanza of the Creed. I believe in one secret and ineffable Lord. That's the Lord's secret and most holy, or Hadith. And in one star in the company of stars of whose fire we are created and to which we shall return. Right? That's the sun, obviously. And in one father of life, mystery of mystery, in his name, chaos, the sole vice regent of the sun upon the earth. Now, who is this chaos person? Crowley describes him as the sole vice regent of the sun upon the earth. That identifies chaos with the surface of the earth, just like our Lord of life and joy of the fifth collect. And we have encountered this term vice region before. We saw it in a quote I showed you in the last lecture. Our religion, therefore, for the people is the cult of the sun, who is our particular star in the body of Nuit. 
His vice regent and representative in the animal kingdom is his cognate symbol, the phallus, representing love and liberty. So the Lord of Life and Joy of the Fifth Collect, Chaos, the Father of Life of the Creed, and the phallus are all different ways of symbolizing the way God, or divinity, presents itself on earth, and what Crowley is here calling the animal kingdom. And we know from what we looked at earlier that the erect phallus is one of several ways Crowley describes the process whereby we discipline our minds and our bodies to become mediums through which the fire of the cobs can flow freely, thereby bringing us from a state of being dead to a state of being alive. Later on, the priest addressing the sun says, let thy light crystallize itself in our blood, fulfilling us of resurrection. That's likely a reference to this idea. To put ourselves into conscious relation with inner truth releases the light trapped within us. It then floods our beings, releasing us from the living death. Our lives are filled with a sense of beauty and purpose. There is no obstacle between the interior depth and the exterior depth. And so there is the feeling of making love with reality that is characteristic of so much mystical experience. And indeed, the raising of the lance in the Gnostic Mass symbolizes a mystical experience of a particular kind, that which Crowley refers to as the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. The innocent and impotent Harpocrates babe becomes the Horus adult by obtaining the wand. Derina Thor seizes the sacred lance. Bacchus becomes Pan. The holy guardian angel is the unconscious creature self, the spiritual phallus. His knowledge and conversation contributes occult puberty. With the raising of the lance, the priest is no longer a man of earth. He's what's called a lover or an adept. Subsequently, everything he does from that point forward in the ritual is not done under his own power as a mortal being. It's done by the power of the lifted lance. In other words, it's done by virtue of him rendering himself open and receptive to the power of the secret and unknown God within him, who is using his physical and mental powers to accomplish the great work. So this evening, we continued our exploration of the nature of the human being, their relationship to truth, and how that relationship to truth is dramatized in Liber 15, the Gnostic Mass. We saw how the cobs or soul of each individual desires to know itself in the universe, and how the only means it has of doing this is to weave the coup, or what Crowley calls the magical garment. We saw that when the cobs weaves the coup and takes a body for itself, in other words, when it's incarnated, it becomes subject to conditions of duality. This has the effect of making the world seem like a place of suffering and dissatisfaction. As a result, the natural human condition, the condition of the uninitiate, is a painful one in which spirit is submerged in matter and one seems a pawn of fate. Crowley's term for this default condition of man is the man of earth. We saw that liberation for Crowley consists in the reunion of the two infinities, hadith within and nuit without, but that this cannot entail the complete elimination of duality. The elimination of duality would mean death and a lack of experience. To experience liberation in this life, one must instead resolve what he calls the complexes in the coup and make it transparent to the light within. This is also symbolized by the creation of unity from duality, represented by the various two-in-one symbols in Thelema. We also saw that liberation does not entail the return of the star to undifferentiated union with some higher reality or superconsciousness, but instead requires the full incarnation of the cobs. One must become completely alive for the first time. This is why Crowley rejects the Gnostic idea of the return to the Pleroma, or really any ascetic, life-rejecting path. 
in favor of a path in which we engage magically with duality so as to create an image of unity from it. We then looked at two other important ways Crowley represents the path of liberation. We considered the sacrament of penance, which is the work of the three alchemical principles of sulfur, mercury, and salt. We saw how the application of these principles prepares the lower part of the soul to receive the spark of the higher, which is symbolized by the holy oil. And we considered the symbol of the phallus, which when erect becomes an hollow tube to bring down fire from heaven. Similar to the sacrament of penance, the lower self becomes the passive medium for the influx of the higher self. We contrasted this use of the phallus or the will with that represented by amfortas. While the erect phallus represents the adept who is open to the flow of the fire of heaven, amfortas represents self-enclosure and overweening self-mastery, which Crowley likens to masturbation. We then utilized this theoretical framework to interpret the ceremony of the introit, the first part of the Gnostic Mass. We saw how the tomb and the priest in it represent the human condition and the man of earth. We saw how the priestess's work with the sword, the salt water, and the incense represents the sacrament of penance, or the application of the three alchemical principles of mercury, salt, and sulfur, respectively. We saw how the influx of the higher, represented by the application of the holy oil, is represented in the Gnostic Mass by the priestess adorning the priest with the robe, the crown, and the stroking of the lance. We saw how the raising of the lance is analogous to the erect phallus in chapter 15 of the Book of Lies. We saw that the raising of the lance also represents the priest's occult puberty, or the knowledge and conversation of his holy guardian angel. It transforms the priest from a mere man of earth into a lover or an adept. It represents the lower part of the priest's soul rendered disciplined and open to receive the fire of the cobs, and how everything else the priest accomplishes in the ritual is by virtue of the power of the raised lance. In other words, his body a mere vehicle of the will. Next time, we're going to look more closely at the priest's transformation into an adept and what this entails. We will look at the particular empowerments that come with this transformation, as well as the limitations represented by the priestess's 11 strokes on the priest's lance. We will also begin to look in greater depth at the nature of the divine power the priest has been united with. We will see that he has been united with a god represented by three symbols that are tied together. The robe of scarlet and gold represents the son or the father. This is Yod. The serpent crown represents Hadith, the secret lord or the holy spirit. This is Aleph. The raised lance represents chaos or the sun. This is Val. Together they represent Iao, the three-in-one god that is worshipped in the Gnostic Mass. In the first part of the ceremony of the introit, the lower part of the priest is disciplined with the three alchemical principles of mercury, salt, and sulfur. These are represented by the three Hebrew letters, Aleph, Mem, and Shin. With his union with Iao, he is now represented by the formula Ashiam, the star of the serpent. As the hexagram, or six, he can now work with the priestess, who is He, or five, to accomplish the great work. Six plus five equals 11, Abrahadabra. But this empowerment comes with limitations, which we will also have to consider. I would like to thank first and foremost my friend Scott back here for once again running uh, tech for tonight's talk as a result of his work, we are able both to record this talk and uh, live stream it. I'd also like to thank Horizon Lodge for hosting this talk. If you can spare a few dollars for Horizon, your contribution helps to uh, keep on the lights and keep us in this uh, space and continuing to bring you events like this one. I would like to uh, thank my audience tonight, my live audience, uh, both for your attention and for your patience while we have navigated through what is admittedly some very subtle uh, and nuanced uh, spiritual terrain um, to deal with some very core issues.
Um, I would be happy to uh, answer any questions that uh, people have at this point. I know it's a bit of a fire hose talk, but um, we can hang out here and answer questions either in person or online or uh, sometimes sometimes wine in a more relaxed atmosphere helps with that too. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, you you uh, mentioned Jung earlier, early in the talk, and uh, it strikes me that uh, that uh, much of uh, your breakdown of uh, Gnostic mass relates to his uh, archetypes of the collective unconscious, uh, specifically around uh, magical procedures, ritual drama, and ident identification with the god and hero. Mm -hmm. uh, have Have you uh, read? Uh, read Jung in that regard? Or? Uh, so the question, since they, they don't have audience audio at home, the question was, um, with reference to the uh, mention of Jung earlier, had I personally read um, Jung on these matters and to what extent had I applied it? Um, I'm not really, I'm, I've read some Jung, but I would not consider myself um, anything close to an expert. Um, I kind of have the general sort of like, gist of what collective unconscious is. I'm probably more familiar with his writings on, on Christianity. Um, you asked specifically about um, heroes and, and heroism, and um, that's an aspect that I was thinking of touching upon in this talk. It would have been such a long sidebar, though, but there, there's certainly something very heroic in the idea of the path of liberation that Thelema represents insofar as it is a turning toward those most vulnerable aspects of ourselves so and, and, and a taking a taking up of it right so that's sort of like the theme that I was trying to, to hammer home here and obviously something quite analogous there with Christianity as, as well um, that's certainly how um, Young, you know, understood Christianity to a certain extent too. The the part of Christianity that's lost is is you know it's lost through vicarious atonement, right? And Jesus did it, so you don't have to worry about it. But in a certain sense, you know, Thelema is a command to, you know, be Jesus for yourself, essentially to you know take up take up your own condition and to transcend it, right? So also something of the you know little something of Nietzsche in there too, I I would imagine. Um, specifically with archetypes of the of the collective. Unconscious. I can't answer to that specifically. It's, I, 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 it's been too long since I've read that. So, <laughs> my, my apologies for that. But certainly, there are parallels here. Absolutely, with, with, um, what Young was up to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you covered the ceremony, the introit. Do you have any thoughts? Uh, one thing that you, I don't know if you touched on. Maybe I missed it. Um, but just just for completion's sake, <laughs> the uh, joining of the elements. Do you think oh. that has any uh, relevance to you know the the theme that you're you're putting together here, or is there something you should just off the top of your head like you know kind of explore? Yeah. So the the question was um, whether I had any thoughts in particular on the joining of the elements. What what he means is that. Um, the priestess puts salt into the water and, and stirs it and um, let the salt of earth admonish the waters to bear the virtue of the great sea. And then she does a similar thing with fire and, and air. So it's the joining of the um, two passive elements and then the joining of the two active elements. Um, I, I don't know to what extent that would further the particular thesis that I'm advancing here, except that the idea of the joining the, the joining of opposites is clearly very important to Crowley's conception of, of the great work. So, right, get the two passive elements together, get the two masculine together, and then right, get them get them into the priest. Um, I've I've I avoided that in favor of the sort of trinity of alchemical things. I went that way too. And I feel like that's hammered in because the children are white and black too, right? Which kind of get, you know, puts puts you in that mindset of um of 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 alchemy and the joining the joining of the alchemical principles. Um I don't know. Did did, did you have any 
thought, any particular thought? I don't have anything more specific than that. Um, other than just sort of kind of riffing on what the priestess says, like she could be indicating the manner by which, you know, something becomes fixed. So like there's the, the salt joins to the, the water. It admonishes the water. Sure. The virtue of the great sea it creates a salt water, which is generally used in pickling, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> she pickles. She pickles the priest. Yeah, or something. You know, it 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 by you know it's sort of a sympathetic action, and likewise, you're sacrificing the the incense to the fire. But I don't know. there's there's no. It's interesting. It's interesting because there are little details there that could they could be significant. Um, Part of the reason why I glossed over that is because the salt and the water both go really nicely together just with the principle of salt because water is mem and mem is also, right? So it kind of all collapses nicely there. It doesn't with the fire and the air necessarily, right? It's not entirely clear why air would have some connection with sulfur in particular, except that it combusts the sulfur, right? That, that would really be the only connection. So, um, yeah, the short answer is that I didn't talk about it because it didn't, it didn't fit my, my project that I was trying to do, but it could, it could possibly be worked. But in. I think sulfur meshes well with air in that it's yellow and it is That's like right. the incense in that it smells. <laughs> Whereas fire doesn't, you know, it's just more of an action. Yeah. Yeah. Any other? Do we have any questions from the online audience? Um, the online audience is silent tonight. Oh, they're very silent. <laughs> they're in. They're silent as they're the tomb. Good. They are silent as the in tomb. Contemplation. Well, that's fine. So, if there are no more questions for this moment, we can um, retire to the other room. We can allow the um, the at home audience to retire to wherever they're going to go to, and we can retire to the foyer and relax for a little bit and continue our our conversation. Um, Thank you all again for your um, attention and indulgence. And um, yeah, that's that's all for tonight. Good night, everyone. Love is the law. Love under will. Thank you.